And um, today we have a special guest speaker. His name is John Burris, and his first pastor job was actually here in Logan. Uh, he was the pastor at First Baptist in Logan, and he's pastored in Tennessee and Ohio, and before he was a pastor, he was a principal, so he knows something about discipline. Um, he has two, two boys, and he uh, pastored in Chillicothe for 31 years. So Ebenezer Church, if you would join me in applauding John Burris. It is good to be with you today, and I appreciate Steve asking me to uh, fill the pulpit for him. We need to pray for him as he's away doing the Lord's work, and, and you can help in that by praying for him and that God will use him in a mighty way. But uh, I'm very impressed with your facilities. I saw it about a, maybe three years ago. I came during the week one time, my wife and I, and we walked through it. Very impressive. You, you should be proud of how God has used you to build such a facility and such a uh, church as I see sitting out there t today. And uh, uh, I don't know who's responsible for the signs, but you need to pat them on the back and give them a raise. <laughs> because I'm telling you, it is an excellent, excellent job. I had I'd forgotten how to get here. I had no idea where I was coming. And buddy, those signs just brought me right here, no trouble whatsoever. And so whoever you are, you're good. <laughs> you're good, you're good. They need to give you a raise. And, and, uh, but thank you for, for, being, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be with you. Chuck and Chris, uh, as well as many of you others, but Chuck and Chris has made me feel so welcome. And so I thank these guys for for doing that and making me uh, feel at home here. Uh, I just uh, always want to leave and I'm just going to pick on him. You know when to leave, don't you, brother? <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you anyway because I bet he hasn't told you, and so I'm going to tell you. Part of my responsibility is not just preach the Word of God, but it's also help you understand your staff. Uh, <laughs> did, did Chris tell you about when he was a little baby and his mother was holding me in her arms and oh she was just so proud of little Chris and and uh, they got on a bus up in Columbus so she would just hold him oh just precious little Chris and uh, a guy comes up and says lady I just want you to know something that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen in my life <laughs> well she just starts bawling she's <laughs> and starts crying a drunk comes up and he says what's wrong lady she goes, that man back there, he hurt my feelings. And he's, oh, I tell you what, I'm too drunk to do anything about it, but let me hold your monkey and you go back there and hit him. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. I, I just made that up. I just, and I, I got Chris's permission to pick on him. So uh, when, when it's over, you can tell him, but he gave me permission. Take your Bibles, turn with me, please. To James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Uh, James of all authors. You know, Paul's a theologian. I mean, man, he gets deep. James is just, man, he just writes and puts it where it, the rubber hits the road. Just so practical. And so let's just see what he says. I want us to look at the mercies of God this morning. The mercies of God. James chapter 2. And look in verses 8 and following. I'm using the New American Standard. That's the closest to the original, so I'm using a New American Standard. If, however, you're fulfilling the royal law, some say the sovereign law, according to the Scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing good, well. But if you show partiality or you... Uh, Look down on someone uh, because of how they dress or, or whatever it might be. You're committing a sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law, and now watch this, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. 
We don't like that. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. And here's one of the most frightening phrases, in my opinion, it's one of the most frightening phrases in all the Bible. If this don't make cold chills run up your spine, you're dead and don't know it. For judgment will be merciless. Or I think King James says, judgment without mercy. Whew, it's scary, isn't it? Judgment without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Now, here's a precious one. But mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be in your house on your day to worship you. I thank you, God, for each person present today. I thank you, God, that they have their priorities right. They chose to come and to lift your name above every name and just to worship you. Thank you already for how we have felt your presence through the music and prayer time, fellowship time. Now, Father, take your word, speak to our hearts. And I pray this in the very precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. One of the problems of getting men saved is getting them lost. Because you see, so many people are not saved because they don't see themselves as lost. And they don't see themselves lost because they do not recognize their sinfulness. Someone has well said that America is full of egomaniacs strutting their way to hell, believing they're too good to be damned. I think it's true. I heard of a parable of a king who went aboard one of his ships and he went down below and uh, where the men were barebacked and sweating and where they're rolling a big ship. And he goes to the first one and he says, what are you doing here? He said, ah, King Sire, he said, I was standing on a corner and a, and a crime was committed and they arrested me and here I am and I'm innocent. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an outstanding citizen. He goes to the next man and said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, someone lied and, and his courts believed it and, uh, and convicted me and here I am, but I'm innocent. I'm an outstanding man. And he goes on and on to each one of the men and all of them had their, their similar stories. Came to the last man and said, what are you doing here? He said, ah, oh, King Sire, you see, I sinned against my God, and I sinned against you, my king. And this is my punishment. I deserve it. The king turned to his guard, and he goes, guard, what is this man doing here among all these fine men? Release him. <laughs> You know, the reason many people have not received mercy is because they haven't gone before the king and confessed their sins against God. You see, life is short. Death is sure. Sin is the curse. And Christ is the cure. And we'll never know the cure until we recognize the curse. So now in this section of Scripture, James is going to paint a pretty bad picture of the human race. And what he boils down to saying, he saying is that the only hope I have and the only hope that you have to get to heaven is the mercy of God. God can show mercy and, and we'll see this that's what we need. That's what we need in our lives. And, and I pray that God will help me to see and help you to see the truth that James is presenting this morning. How we need the mercy of God. That it, there's four things that James shares with us this morning. They all begin with SS. So it's easy to keep an outline if you want to take notes. Number one is the sovereignty of the scripture. Look at verse 8. He says... If, however, you're filling the royal law or uh, another place is a sovereign law, according to the scripture. Now, why would James call the word of God sovereign? 
Because it is from a sovereign God. Why would he call it a royal law? Because it's from a king. It's from the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, when I open this word of God and I begin to preach it, I'm not preaching my words. I am preaching the word of God. Over, listen to me, over 4,000 times in the Old Testament only, we are told that this is the word of God. Because we'll read phrases like this. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, God spoke, God commanded, thus saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Over and over, you'll read phrases like that in the Old Testament. And what's it saying? This is the word of God. This is God's word. And, and if this is not God's word, then, then it's worthless. It's a book of blasphemy because we know one thing it has 4,000 lives in it. But you see, this is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God. And don't you let anyone ever tell you any different. And if you decide that you're going to turn your back on this, or you're not going to obey it, or you're going to ignore it, then you're not going to give an account to some preacher. You're going to give an account to the author. Because this is his word. So let's, let's establish that. This is the word of God. Amen? Amen. Well, some of you are not sure. Let's try it one more time. This is the Word of God, right? Amen. 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 It is. Now that we know that, and we've placed that as a foundation, now let's turn and say, okay, James, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what else do you have to tell us under the inspiration? Because this is God's Word. So you tell us. Look at the second thing. Not only the sovereignty of the Scripture, but the sinfulness of the sinner. Verses 9 through 11. I've read those. He talks about that the law is so sovereign, the law is so holy because it comes from a holy, righteous God. And that makes it holy. That makes it sovereign. And it is so sovereign, so holy, that if you break it in one point, you're guilty of all. You know, I don't like that. Well, it's not up for vote. It's true. And James even breaks it down and says, if you are a respecter of persons, if you look down on a person because of how they dress or the work they do, then you sin. And so if you transgress the law, at one point you're guilty of all. So, so uh, he, he says the transgression of the law is sin. Now let's just put it this way now. How many of the Ten Commandments do you have to break to be a sinner? Ten? No. You just break one or you break one of the, the principles or teachings of the Christ. You are a sinner. You have, you have transgressed the law. See, here, here's the, what's the matter with most of us. We have no real conception of what sin is. In our society today... Men are not evil anymore. They're just sick. Oh, excuse it away. Preachers don't preach on sin anymore because it may offend someone. And so our society is in a day that almost anything goes, nothing's wrong. And we have no real concept of sin. I dare say right now, as I begin to this, some of you are saying, boy, I'm glad he's going to preach on sin. Some of these people need to hear it. <laughs> but, you see, I, I, I want us to come to the place where we, like, say, well, like Pogo said, we have met the enemy and they is us. And that's what I pray with each that we'll come, every one of us will come and say, it's me, oh Lord, it's me standing in the need of prayer. Now let's look at some definitions. Now I'm a former principal in Metropolitan Niceville Public Schools. And so let's, let's, let me give you a test. Okay, I'm going to give you a test. Don't look on anyone else's paper. <laughs> All right. I want us to look at some Bible definitions of sin. Not mine. The Bible. So if you have an argument about if that's sin or not, take it up with God, not me. All right. 
And remember, for whosoever, look what he says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend it in one point, he's guilty of all. Now keep that in mind. All right. 1 John 3, 4. Here's the first definition of sin. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Look up here. Where God says, thou shalt not, and you do, you have transgressed the law. You're a sinner. Where the Bible says, thou shalt, and you don't, you have transgressed the law, and you sinned, and you're a sinner. You see, sin is transgression of the law. Let's go to another. That's one definition. Another one. James 4, 7. Therefore, him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now listen to me again. Do you hear what James is saying? To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, it is sin. Now, here's, a, here's another little pop quiz. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have loved every time you ought to have loved? How many of you have prayed every time you ought to have prayed? How many of you have read the Bible every time you ought to have read the Bible? How many of you have given money every time you ought to have given money? Huh? Huh? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So every time you didn't show love to that person you should have shown love to, you sin. Every time God said, read my word and you didn't, you sin. You see, it, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So I think we'll all have to come and say what? Guilty, aren't we? Shake your head, yes. Well, some of you look so sanctified back there. Oh, my. We all have sin. I mean, just that little test shows we're sinners. I heard about a soldier that was court-martialed because he was picking violence for his girlfriend. And you say, well, boy, he had a cruel commander, didn't he? Court martial just for picking flowers. No, he was on guard duty and the enemy slipped in. You see, he wasn't doing anything wrong, but he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. I'm wondering, just wondering, just a thought. Are there some of you that God may have said to you, I want you to teach. Or I want you to serve on this committee. Or I want you to go to visitation. Or I want you to do, and you didn't do it. You see, my children's in the ball. Or I just don't have time. You see, you're not doing anything bad. But you're not doing what you ought to be doing because God told you he wanted you to do it. I heard about an employee far, fired an employee. He said, you're fired. He said, why? I haven't done anything. He said, I know. That's why you're fired. <laughs> Some of you are just sitting back there and God said, I want you to be doing this. And you, I can't. And you're doing nothing. Well, listen, another definition. Whatsoever is not of faith, this is Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, Paul is not saying if you don't have enough faith, you're a sinner. He's not saying that at all. What he is saying is if you have a practice or if you have a habit in your life that you, you do not know if it's right or wrong, and you go on and do it. I don't care what God thinks about this. I enjoy it and I'm going to do it. 
So this habit or practice, you're going to do it. And, and you know in your heart of hearts, you can't ask God to bless it. But you don't care, you're going to go on. That's what James says. says now, if you have a habit or practice in your life, and it's doubtful and you continue to do it, it's sin. Heard about two couples that was going to go out to eat. And so one couple met at this other couple's house. And they got there a little early and the man wasn't ready. So the wife was entertaining the couple. And from the bedroom, the man yells, Honey, is this shirt clean enough? She hollers back, No. So he comes out, button up another shirt. He said, How'd you know that shirt wasn't clean enough? said, If you had to ask, it wasn't. <laughs> Folks, most of the time when something's doubtful, it's dirty. If you can't ask God to bless whatever habits in your life or practice in your life, it's a pretty sure thing. It, it, you need to leave it alone. You can't do it in faith. So he says, it's sin. Now, is there something you're doing in life that you, you can't ask God for that is sin? All right, here's another one. Human goodness. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteous are as filthy rags in his sight. You see, all those things, look up here, all of those things that you're counting on to get you to heaven, all those good works that you think is going to get you to heaven, you know what God says about those? There is filthy rags. Now, filthy rags, what that is, is, is when a leper has leprosy. Leprosy is a, is a disease that forms boils on the, on the body. And they fester and soon they ooze fluid from those sores. And so what people did in that day, they didn't have bandages or anything. So they would take rags and they would wrap that leprosy up because it's just oozing all that infection out. And they soon get soaked with all those infections, uh, fluids that's coming from the body. Now, that's called filthy rags. And God says, now, here's what I think about all those good things you're doing that you think is going to get you to heaven. There is filthy rags. They're sin. You see, in other words, let, let me encourage you to do this. I, I, I should have put a, given you an outline. I didn't. I, I apologize for that. But the worst form of badness is human goodness when it becomes a substitute for the new birth. Now let that sink in. The worst form of badness, we think, oh, we'll start naming sins, adultery, blah, murder, when we're not, no, uh-uh. The worst form of badness is human goodness when it becomes a substitute for the new birth. All right, so this is definition. Unbelief is sin. In John 3, 18, he said, He that believeth not is condemned already. But he that believeth on the Son of God, not condemned. Unbelief is sin. In fact, that's the root. <clears throat> that's the sin that all the other sins flow out of. So I guess we can say, really, in all honesty, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You see, we have that old, old nature uh, uh, that's ours. All right, you got it? <clears throat> the sovereignty of scriptures. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the sovereignty of scriptures. The sinfulness of sinners. Now let's look at the third thing. The severity of the sentence. Verses 12 and 13. James says, now there's going to come a judgment. And it's going to be a severe judgment. Now we like to talk about God as love. God is good, good all the time, or however that goes. I, I would love to go into church sometime and hear them say, God is just. All the time, all the time, God is just. <laughs> now, I know I'm not criticizing God is love. God is good, but he's also a just God, which means he must punish sin. If he doesn't punish sin, he'll cease to be just. If he doesn't punish sin, he ceases to be holy. And so he is holy, and James says, now listen, there's going to come a day 
when there's going to be a judgment. And look what he says. As I said, that's, I think, one of the most frightening phrases in all the Bible. It's going to be judgment without mercy. Judgment without mercy. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, but mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. And he said, there's going to come a time when, that, when you're going to stand before the white throne judgment. Stand before Christ. And there will be no, no mercy. Now, who is going to stand before the ju- white throne judgment? Who's going? To, well, look at verse 13. Those who show no mercy. Now, don't misunderstand what James is saying. James is not saying if you show mercy, then God's going to show mercy to you. He's not saying that at all. He is saying if you have Christ in your life, you're going to show mercy. That's just evidence. You're going to show love. Why? Because God is love. And if God lives in your life, he's going to manifest himself in your life. You're going to show love. You're going to show mercy. And so those who's going to stand before Christ are, uh, at the great white throne judgment are those who have not trusted Christ, do not have Christ living in their life. And the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. You see, there is going to come that day when the graves of the unsaved are going to vomit up the screaming and moaning dead. And they're going to stand before Christ at great white throne judgment. And you know what's going to happen? There are going to be three parts, just like any other trial. First, there'll be evidence. And God is going to have you accountable for every lie you ever told. For every time you parked on Lover's Lane. For every time you looked over and took, copied someone's answer off of a paper. For every time you ever gossip about somebody. In other words, you're going to give an account for every sin you've ever committed. That's going to be the evidence. Then comes the defense. And I can hear what some of you would say. You would say, well... Well, Lord, see, I didn't make a decision. Uh, you see, I'll tell you why I didn't make a decision. You see, there were Baptists, there was Methodists, there was Catholics, there was Presbyterians, there was the community church. Uh, I, I didn't know what church to, to believe in. I mean, uh, and he's going to say to you, I didn't say believe in the church. I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You say, well, well, see, Jesus, I, I didn't make a decision because one day I was at Ebenezer Baptist Church and there was some preacher there by the name of John Burris and he got up there and he waved his Bible and he pounded the pulpit. And Jesus, would you believe he had the audacity to call me a sinner? And he's going to say, I didn't say believe in a preacher. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But, but see, see, Lord, I, I, didn't, I didn't make a decision because, you see, I, I was going to go to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Logan, Ohio, and I found out something. I found out there are hypocrites in that church. And he's going to say to you, I didn't say believe in hypocrites. I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Folks, don't you let any hypocrite keep you from coming to Christ. Just, just as a sidebar. Let me step over here on the sidebar. Jesus had 12 disciples, right? One of those was a hypocrite. And you know what I've discovered in all my ministry? That's just about right. One out of, well, at least Baptist. I don't know about other denominations. But about one out of every 12 Baptists is a hypocrite. That's, that's what I've discovered. Now, if that makes you mad, you come up afterwards and apologize, and I'll forgive you. <laughs> you see, don't let a hypocrite. Well, I, I, can, I can hear you say, well, see, see, Jesus, I didn't make a decision because, you see, I wasn't going to walk that aisle until I knew I could live it. And he's going to say to you, live it. Live it. 
I didn't say believe in yourself. I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And some of you will say, well, Jesus, see, I didn't have a chance. You see, I was driving and, and a drunk came across the center line and he hit me head on and I was killed. I didn't have a chance. And he goes, oh, yes, you did. And he's going to turn on his video recorder and he's going to play the service back to you. And he goes, oh, no. On August the 3rd, 2014 at Ebenezer Baptist Church, you sat there and my servant John Burris pleaded with you to give your heart to Jesus. And you didn't do it. You had time. Well, defense is rest. Now comes the verdict. And Jesus is going to turn to you. He said, you denied me before man. I'm going to deny you before the Heavenly Father. Depart from me into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the recording angel is going to say, Lord, what shall I write? And he'll say, write L-O-S-T, lost. And you're going to scream, oh God, have mercy, have mercy. And there'll be none. James said, there'll be no mercy. Oh God, how grace, the day of grace has begun. Well, I don't want to end there. That's terrible, isn't it? Let's go to the last point. The sweetness of salvation. The sweetness of salvation. Now, that's a good way to end. The sweetness of salvation. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, if you will turn from your sins and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, he'll come into your life. He'll forgive you of your sins. Write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're adopted as a child of God, and heaven becomes your home. You see, Jesus did the work. You don't have to. All you have to do is, by faith, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And all that's yours. And, and you'll have the Holy Spirit to come into your life to help you to live this life. You see, salvation is not just in the sweet by and by. It's for the nasty now and now. And the Holy Spirit will help you to live, to live that life today. To be that husband, be that father, to be that son, or be that daughter you should be. And you'll have the assurance that, that you know, whenever heaven's going to be my home. Whenever it happens. Let me close it this way. And I hope I can get through it. If not, forgive me. But January of this year, January 22nd, my wife went home to be with the Lord. We've been married 49 and a half years. Um, she was in the hospital 90 days. Uh, I never left her side except to run and get a hamburger. And a lot of times I just run out of the car and get peanut butter and crackers and eat them and then run back in because she didn't want me to leave her. I lived out of my car. It got so bad. She had a tremendous tolerance of pain. Unbelievable. But it got so bad, she would just cry like a baby. She was in such pain. She said, oh, John, I want God to take me home. As Chris introduced, we have two boys, two sons. And so we agreed when she went in and had the surgery that mother was going to, care, was going to call the shots with her. With the guidance of the doctor, she's going to call the shots. We weren't going to make her do anything she didn't want to do. She finally says, John, I can't take it anymore. She said, I want you to take me home. And I want to go home from home. I said, Jeannie, that's what you want. She said, John, I can't take it anymore. We took her home so she could go home from home. 
Her father and brother came from Tennessee, told her bye. I heard her t- I, they whispered something in each other's ear. I don't know why, except I heard her say, you were a good daddy. They told her bye. Then all the grandchildren came by. They told her bye. Then Jeff, and then Joel, and then I leaned over and kissed her and told her bye. Folks, I've been by the bedside of many dying persons, but I have never, ever seen such peace in all my life. She was able to stay home three days before she died. She got to tell everybody bye. But such peace. Now, how could she do that? When we brought her from Columbus, from Ohio State, when we brought her, I said, I want you to take 35. I said, well, I said, to go, to go home. It's a shorter way, but I want you to go 35. It's a little longer. I said, but I want to. I want to see our church. She helped, helped me and other people to build. And we drove by and said, Jeannie, look, honey, there's our church. How could she do it? Here's what she said. John, if heaven is high, as sweet as you have preached it. And Jeff, that's our son, have preached it. And my daddy's preached it. I can't wait to get there. Do you know why she could die with such peace? You know why there was no fear? Because, you see, she knew that she had placed her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It wasn't dependent upon her. It's finished It's up on the finished work of Christ on Calvary and his resurrection. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? If you can't say yes, then just in just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come forward and say, Brother John, I want to get it settled. I want to trust Jesus today. Maybe you're here and you're honest with yourself. You'll say, you know what? I don't know if I would or not. I hope I will. Don't you have a hope so religion? Our Lord don't want you to have a hope so religion. He wants you to have a no so religion, just as Jeannie did. She knew heaven was her home. So if you have a doubt, just come. Don't be ashamed of it. Just come and say, Brother John, I'm not sure. I think I've trusted him. I think heaven, but I just want to get that settled. Maybe some of you here. And you've been coming to this church. The people's friendly. You've got a great pastor. God's blessing this church. Unbelievable. And you want to be a part of this church then we're going to give you an opportunity to just come down the aisle and come to me and say, Brother John, I, I want to join this church, or we want to join this church. Maybe you're sitting back there and say, oh, I just, I just don't know if I can go up there. Reach over that husband or wife or that friend and say, hey, go with me. And with both of you step out and just come and say, I've, I've come to make that decision. I want to trust Christ, or I want to join this church, or... Maybe, you, maybe you're a church member and you want to recommit that life to Christ. Not that you've done anything bad, but you, you're just not completely sold out to Christ. And you want to commit that life to him again. You come. Say, I want to rededicate my life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, just thank you for your word. Now, Father, as we come to this time when, of decision time, When each and every person will, God, make that decision of are they going to continue on as they are? 
Or are they going to hear your voice and obey you and make that decision that you're laying up on their heart? Give them the courage, the faith they need to make that decision. And I pray this in the very precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411. Whisper.